Item number, SCP-342. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-342 can be safely stored in its case file folder, in an envelope stapled to the inside cover, as it poses no danger so long it is not actively used. Said case file folder should be kept in a secure file cabinet in high value item storage and protected by a standard array of biological, chemical, mimetic, and physical positive action defenses. Description SCP-342 normally takes the form of a mass transit ticket for the closest form of mass transportation to its current location. At the moment, it takes the form of a train ticket, departing from station. When held by a sentient person for any length of time, it will eventually change form into a transit ticket for a form of transportation its holder desires to use. This transformation always takes place when not being directly or indirectly observed. No recordings of SCP-342 changing form exist at this time. SCP-342 is indistinguishable from any valid transit ticket and may be used as such. Should SCP-342 be validated by stamp, tearing off the ticket stub, or disposal, it will reform itself into an unused ticket after a short period of time. SCP Foundation personnel should be on site to recover SCP-342 after the conclusion of any field experiments. Anyone who uses SCP-342 to board a vehicle is unable to exit said vehicle by any means. Once the vehicle ends its route and ceases movement, the user will disappear from this reality. Users report a mounting feeling of dread prior to boarding the vehicle, which increases during the course of the journey and culminates in panic-inducing terror shortly before disappearance. Specific phenomena often resemble acute paranoid schizophrenia and include a perception of increased darkness of the sky outside the vehicle, fog, premature night, or most frequently, dreary, depressing weather, auditory hallucinations, most frequently, misperception of normal announcements by drivers and passengers, i.e., an announcement of the next stop is heard as a declaration that the user will never stop. Normal objects, such as other passengers and non-threatening items, suddenly taking a threatening tone or appearance. An almost pathological fear of the drivers, conductors, and other transit staff. Strange occurrences completely preventing the rider from getting off of the vehicle. The absolute knowledge that it is impossible to get off. Inability to perceive other passengers exiting and entering the vehicle. Users report that other passengers appear to simply appear and vanish from their seats, and in some cases, cannot perceive that a passenger has exited the vehicle, continuing to see them in their seats. Inability to hear or perceive attempts to calm or reason with them. Although the most acute experiences are limited to the user only, bystanders, including agents assigned to observe the subject, do report feelings of uneasiness and will be compelled to exit the vehicle early, seeking other means of transportation. Addendum 342A Object was discovered in Chicago during 1936 by Data Expunged. Case was reopened several years later, as it was hoped that advances in technology would allow for a deeper understanding of Data Expunged. Addendum 342B the importance of retrieving SCP-342 after it is validated for travel cannot be understated. Please see report regarding Dr. Lank incident, in which SCP-342 was not successfully retrieved after validation, resulting in a six-month-long containment breach, causing the disappearances of several New York City civilians. SCP Foundation personnel are requested and required to use any means up to and including impersonation of a peace officer, intimidation, and threats or actual use of deadly force to retrieve the item. Addendum 342C Agent Report Our first experiment with a ticket had a Class D personnel member enter onto a bus using the object. We stationed agents at each of the stops to observe his behavior without actually entering onto the vehicle, a precaution in case everyone who got on was in some way affected. The old reports were vague in this area. Many times he simply sat in place, or paced up and down the aisles. Increasingly, he began to stare outside in horror, and the last few times we could not locate him. 
At the final point before the bus was to be parked for the night, we saw him pounding on the window with a pleading expression, screaming towards the agents for help as it pulled away, a strange mist filling much of the background behind him. As we could not draw many conclusions from this event, we decided to track down some of the passengers and interrogate them, to hopefully shed some light on what happened. Many were hesitant to talk, or claimed that they did not notice anything, saying they were preoccupied by something or distracted by illness, aches, or feelings of foreboding. We finally found some useful information from three boys, one 15-year-old Caucasian and two 16-year-olds, Hispanic, who were riding the bus near the front for part of the trip. We were told that our test subject had tried to leave several times, but his pulling on the stop bell was always ignored, and the doors seemed to close right before he could get out. He would run and just not make it, or walk from a distance and get manipulated into the back of the line. Finally, he sat right at the head of the bus, so he could be close enough to get out in time, but every chance he got, there were too many people swarming on or off for him to leave. Something about this event seemed to bother the boys. One of them was particularly irritated, but could not explain the source. Under hypnosis, he described what to him was a moment of pure dread, that he had seen a few people in the crowd of passengers actually push the man back on, subtly hold him back, or trip him, all while staring ahead innocently, like they didn't even notice that they were doing it. Finally, after shouting at the driver that he wanted to get off for a good 10 minutes, which the driver ignored, aside from requesting that the subject sit still and be quiet, the man went back to his seat, apparently giving up in despair. Two of the boys said that the man actually shrieked and stumbled back to his seat in fright when the driver turned around at him. The other didn't realize that the two were in conflict, which is contrary to his usual habit of avidly looking for and watching fights on the particularly rough inner city buses. After going back to his seat, the boys said they promptly forgot about the subject, most likely because he was not struggling anymore. The next time they saw him, he was three seats back, then five, then seven, but at no point could they recall seeing him stand up from his seat to move further back. This was all they could tell us, and it seemed to cost them plenty to even reveal this. On a side note, at the end of our session, the youngest teen screamed. It was like it swallowed him in the end, and promptly had to be hospitalized for extreme psychosis. Addendum 342D, Subway Experiment 2. Note by Supervising Officer, Subway Experiment 2 was the first time we had an observer alongside the passenger. Agent Strom paid attention to the smallest details of the Class D personnel's behavior, took various fluid samples, and tested organs, mostly the heart and brain, until the man became too aggressive to examine. He also recorded an excellent log of all subjective and objective events. Since the physical examinations provided no special signs, except that the subject was in the midst of a typical nervous breakdown, Said information has been placed in Document 342-D Alpha. Only the most relevant information has been included here. The two men bought passage, the prisoner presenting the ticket. Immediately, he became aggravated and said to the person accepting his ticket, What did you say to me, bitch? Are you threatening me? He was quickly hurried along to avoid an incident and was almost immediately separated from the agent accompanying him by a pair of security guards. Agent Strom reports that the guards appeared to be in a trance and attempted to separate him from the user, softly chanting, One at a time, please. Nevertheless, he managed to push his way through by force, although he was forced to knock down one officer who attempted to interpose himself between Agent Strom and the door. On the train, the user became very quiet. Surprising, as he was one of our most violent D-Class personnel, Agent Strom continued testing and interviewing until the prisoner said softly, Let me off this f***ing train. Agent Strom said that they could leave after a few more hours, at which point the user became insanely aggressive and began jumping up and down, off the walls, and swinging on the bars and holders, while howling like a primate. Agent Strom knocked him out with a blow to the head from his truncheon and handcuffed him to a pole. To assuage civilian fears, he held up a badge that said he was a U.S. Marshal and went back to his analysis. 
Physical analysis indicated that the prisoner had entered a REM sleep state after only three minutes, which is especially unusual in a subject who had been knocked unconscious. After the subject woke up, Agent Strom made the decision to abort the experiment and told the D-Class subject that he would help him get off the subway as soon as possible, if he cooperated. Holding him tightly, they attempted to leave, but were prevented from doing so by the crowd. Agent Strom attempted to exit a second time at the next stop, taking the precaution of holding up his badge and ordering all passengers to remain in their seats. Nonetheless, he was prevented from exiting the vehicle by the crowd boarding the train. Agent Strom reported that the prisoner was almost pulled away from him. He was unable to determine by what means, but claimed that the hands that pulled him back didn't belong to any passengers. Fortunately, Agent Strom had handcuffed himself to the subject and was able to maintain contact with the D-Class personnel, although his attempt to exit the vehicle was unsuccessful. Now in a state of panic, the prisoner clung to the agent like a frightened child, so tightly that Strom had bruise marks on his chest and arms for days, and screamed several times that the handcuffs were slipping off. In the chaos, Agent Strom's badge was knocked out of his hand, and he sustained a blow to the side of the head. During the ride to the third stop, Agent Strom, in a highly aggravated manner, interrogated the new passengers to find out who had hit him. No one would give him any hint or clues, and many became hysterical at the merest question or touch. One woman began wailing when Agent Strom grabbed her shoulder, although she was later silenced when he began shaking her vigorously. Security cameras record Agent Strom throwing a male passenger to the floor and striking another in the face, while the D-Class personnel wept and clung to his leg. Given the extraordinary circumstances, the Board of Inquiry has chosen not to reprimand him for this lack of control. Agent Strom made a third attempt to get the prisoner off the train, choosing to take a coordinated approach. Using his radio, he communicated with agents at the next stop, despite difficulty due to static interference. Unusually, both sides said they heard the person talk in a quiet, small voice like a frightened child, although both sides reported that they were using raised voices to be heard over the static. It was at this point that the prisoner began beating on the door, screaming to be let off the vehicle. Agent Strom, although sympathetic, warned the user that he would sedate him if he continued. This seemed to dismay the prisoner more than anything else. According to Agent Strom, he stated, No, that's how it started. A lonely dark ride in unknown parts of the country. Travelers and drifters. The unattached. They would fall asleep with a bottle of booze. And oh God, when they woke up they'd still be going. Still be on. Don't you get it? They wake up and even though they slept for hours, they still be on. Who knows where? He then stated his intent to cooperate, and curled up in a fetal position, rocking slowly. At the next stop, Agents Macabjorn, Kinular, Smith, and Jacobs, accompanied by Dr. Gunster, the project head, boarded the subway and began pushing their way through the crowd towards Agent Strom and the subject. Despite efforts to intimidate the crowd, progress was difficult until Agent Smith fired his weapon into the ceiling and threatened deadly force. The subway car was evacuated of all other passengers, and a protective cordon was placed around the subject. Agent Jacobs ordered the driver to shut down the subway. When the driver appeared confused, he ordered that all power to the subway be cut off. SCP Foundation personnel, in the guise of transit authority officers, then evacuated the entire train, platform, and station of all civilians. Agent Strom, Macabjorn, Kinular, and Smith, and Dr. Gunster then attempted to lead the prisoner off the train. Despite all efforts to lead, cajole, and force him off the train, no efforts were successful. Agent Strom ceased his efforts after the prisoner was threatened with deadly force by Agent Smith, screaming at his fellow agents that he's not holding on to anything, there's some kind of wall. Other agents appeared confused, claiming that the subject was maliciously attempting to impede exit by holding onto one of the supporting bars. 
They continued in this assertion until it was pointed out to them the impossibility that this could take place, given that both of the prisoners' hands were being held by agents at that time. In a last desperate effort to extract the subject, the personnel attempted to dismantle the subway around the user through the use of cutting torches and power tools. Agent Strom remained with the subject, while the others exited to help Foundation personnel prepare. While the equipment was being set up and everyone's backs were turned, the doors closed, and the train immediately started up and pulled away of its own accord. The agents did not manage to catch up to it until the next stop, and passengers immediately filed on, despite their commands not to. Agent Strom was later discovered lying on the subway platform eight kilometers away, in a comatose state. One end of his handcuffs was still attached to his own wrist, but the other was empty. Traces of blood found on the metal have been determined to belong to the subject. Addendum 342E Subway Experiment 3 Possibly due to mental trauma from his loss of subject D-342D, Agent Strom volunteered to be the subject of the next experiment, stating that someone more knowledgeable of our terms and procedures could provide better communication. 057 approved this, after much pleading from Agent Strom. Agent Aaron and Dr. Haber, both close friends of Agent Strom, accompanied him on his trip. The ride on the subway started out normally enough, although Dr. Haber noticed that Agents Aaron and Strom appeared to share a closer understanding of the phenomena experienced by Strom, perhaps as a result of their close friendship. Agent Aaron's empathy allowed Agent Strom to remain coherent and sane for the entire length of the ride, and was able to calmly and rationally talk about seemingly otherworldly events, without breakdown of linguistic and mental functions. For this reason, this experiment was the most useful and rewarding, and a full log of the sequence of events experienced by Agent Strom can be found in the attached documentation. Of particular note, Agent Strom made no effort to leave the subway, or even consider the possibility of doing so. This acceptance of his fate may have allowed an avoidance of mental anguish, as seen in the following log. Dr. Haber Alright, we've got what we need. Now, let's try to get you off this thing. Strom No. Dr. Haber Excuse me? Strom It's too risky. Aaron, we could get separated or hurt. We know what happens every time. Something bad. I'm not taking that chance. Dr. Haber, but he's doing so well. Maybe that's all it is. A willpower thing. You're keeping yourself together. You're calm. You're composed. It doesn't control you. That's it. All it takes is a strong will to pass through the gates. Aaron, if there is a test, it's not here, it's at the end of it all. That's where he's going to need us, need our support. That's where it's going to happen. Strom, quiet. Dr. Haber, look, we can't just let him. Here's the stop. I say we at least attempt it, for results. Strom, morosely, you'll get your results, all right, Doc. At this point, the three personnel attempted to walk to the door. Dr. Hopper. Jesus! Aaron. Step back! It was at this point that a homeless man traveling on the train hurled Dr. Hopper across the room and broke his neck before being shot four times in the chest by Agent Aaron. Foundation personnel waiting at the next platform quickly evacuated them from the train on stretchers. The vagrant died on the way to base, and although transported in a highly secure ambulance, his body disappeared when passing through an abandoned part of town, specifically under a ruin of a train bridge. Agent Aaron ordered the train evacuated and stated his intention to continue the experiment alone, remaining with Strom. Hallucinations continued as the trip progressed. Agent Aaron reported seeing flickering shadows and strange phenomena, while Strom reported more overt hallucinations, including Agent Aaron's face melting apart to reveal a horned red-faced monster and the very metals and materials of the train beginning to melt like wax and mold and reform strangely. Aaron said he found it extremely difficult to think logically or concentrate, but he persevered to stay attached and talking to an increasingly deranged Strom. 
This experiment has led to the formation of the idea that the user travels on two separate trains. The first, the four-dimensional vehicle of reality, and the second, a so-called shadow train that overlaps the first. Both trains move at the same rate, with passengers and personnel perceiving one or the other to various degrees, until the real train reaches the end of the line and stops moving while the shadow train continues. According to Agent Aaron, shortly after reaching the end of the line, Agent Strom began to slowly drift forward towards the front of the train, passing through solid material in the process. When pointed out to Agent Strom, Strom became perturbed and began to run towards the back of the train. Upon reaching the midpoint of the third to last car, Strom began to pound his fist against the air, stating that he was at the end of the train and it's moving, it's pulling out of the station, and that he was unable to proceed further. Agent Aaron attempted to halt Agent Strom's progress, but succeeded only in knocking him to the ground, at which point Strom quickly accelerated towards the front of the train, sliding on his stomach. Fingernail marks were later found in the carpet, where he had clawed at the ground in an attempt to halt his progress. Agent Strom passed through the closed conductor's compartment door and into the conductor's compartment, where he immediately began to cry out in terror. Agent Aaron stated at this point that he drew his service revolver and attempted a benevolent termination of Agent Strom, but was unable to do so through the reinforced glass of the conductor's compartment door. His last reported observation of Agent Strom states that he saw a creature, kind of like an enormous spider, but wearing a conductor's hat, looking up from the levers, wrapping Jerry in a web, like a cocoon, and then throwing him through the window, like it was air. The creature then turned towards Agent Aaron and ordered him to exit the train, at which point Agent Aaron lost consciousness from terror. He was later found huddled at the back of the train car with an empty weapon, continuing to pull the trigger on an empty cylinder over and over, until the weapon was confiscated from him by personnel. Addendum 342F Dr. Gunther's Supplemental Report We set up several situations to try and discover the controls, parameters, and triggers of SCP-342. First, we used a company bus and a driver that worked for our organization, and had the prisoner as the only passenger. Nothing happened, even though the ticket was ripped before entering into the vehicle. We attempted numerous other iterations of the same concept. Prisoners entering a company bus along with other agents and we also had a ticket present to gain entrance. We had them speak of this loudly and obviously, and even denied one agent entrance because he did not have a ticket. Still, the object did not change to resemble a ticket for the fictional transportation system we created. Next, we had unaware citizens entering onto our bus, using tickets we had previously distributed. Once again, the ticket did not change, and our rider was able to leave at any time. We then exchanged our company bus driver for drivers hired from newspaper want ads. The drivers seemed confident at first, and were very excited about the prospects we were offering them, but when the prisoner came aboard, either on an empty bus or a full one, the driver suddenly became very bewildered and overwhelmed, saying that the controls for our bus were too advanced or new to him. He didn't understand the dashboard, he was more comfortable with his own bus, and couldn't drive this one even if the same model bus was used. Attempts to refresh the driver's memories as to the method of operating the bus failed further, until even the steering wheel was considered too complicated. After this failure, it was determined to allow the drivers to use their own buses. Making deals with the corporations and public departments, in the guise of a higher level government bureaucracy, we had them set aside a special time when they would only pick up the prisoner and when they would stop. Although the bosses were fine with this, when the moment came, the drivers refused to change their routine for egg-headed paper pushers. All of them continued on the preset pathways, saying they were too busy or didn't have the time of day to go different routes just because someone ordered them to. Finally, we made a deal with a driver named Bucky Folesworth that he would pick up our passenger along his normal route and would only switch with another driver, one of our personnel, halfway through. Driver Folesworth was offered considerable compensation, was told that failure to cooperate would result in his termination from employment, was instructed to constantly be in contact with us via radio, 
and to stop at the fifth stop, park the vehicle, and let one of our agents get on to drive. In hindsight, we realized that perhaps the ticket was luring us closer and closer to this edge by presenting situations that were so close, yet did nothing, in hopes of having us go just one more alteration further until we crossed the line and allowed it to become fully active. When the prisoner neared the bus stop, the ticket turned to resemble a ticket to that specific vehicle. After realizing that this would be another doomed ride, several members of our team cautioned restraint and suggested we should send an agent to accompany the prisoner. The consensus was we did not want to jeopardize a fragile situation that could suddenly fail at the slightest touch. I will admit a personal failing, as I was tantalized by the prospect of having one of our own be in control of the phenomena and the vitally important data that could be gathered. Unfortunately, our giddiness and desire not to mess with a very important, perhaps once in a lifetime chance, only damned another person. When the bus driver reached the fifth stop, he halted the vehicle as instructed. However, as he attempted to leave his seat, the brakes on the vehicle failed, allowing the bus to speed down the hill, crushing a little girl crossing the street under its wheels. At first we thought this was an attempt by SCP-342 to lash out against us at having outwitted it and kept the prisoner out of its grasp. Shortly afterwards, we realized that the important fact was not that the child was killed, but that the bus was still moving and driver Folesworth was still in command of the vehicle. We tried to get into communication with Bucky, but he refused to talk. We thought maybe this was because he felt guilty for the death of the child and was worried he was going to be punished, so we tried to reassure him that if he stopped now, there would be no repercussions. At this, we got the first word from him, a simple no. We knew then that we would have to use physical force to halt the bus. Setting up roadblocks and tire treads, we punctured two of the tires and temporarily managed to tip it over on its side. However, he still somehow managed to get onto the highway and at one point we lost him when he went under the road. When he was found again, he was speeding, going at least 130 miles per hour in the middle of traffic in the opposite direction. At this point, he was a danger to the entire populace, not just a prisoner. We told local law enforcement to stand down and chased after him with cars and helicopters. The last statement we got from him was, I'm not pulling over. I'm a driver, and that's what I do. That's my purpose. I don't need to switch. I can get him where he's going. After this, he shot off the freeway into open space for about 10 seconds before crashing into another lower lane. We don't know if this was intentional or not, as at the same time he veered towards the sides and headed towards the rails at a slant, a bullet was put into his head by an aerial sniper. From reports, the bus hit the ground and exploded into a fiery blaze. There were no survivors, and many bodies were never discovered or declared missing. One report from a bystander, 26-year-old woman driving in the next lane over who was suspended upside down by her seatbelt and sustained a blow to her head from the crash is of particular interest. She states that she saw a second identical bus rise out of the smoke and pull aside the wreck. It opened its door with a large mechanical sound and waited there for a few seconds until out of the flames came a single burning silhouette shaped like a human corpse. This corpse was said to have entered the bus and sat down, which then pulled away, smoothly navigating the pileup before disappearing. We tried the same parameters. Real vehicle, real passenger, real driver who knows what's going on and is in contact. Three more times, but with trains this time. We also had agents stationed at the train each time. However, the same mix-up happened over and over again. The prisoners inexplicably went on the wrong, unsafe train, even if it was clear which one to enter. Somehow, they got disoriented in the mob and entered the incorrect train, one with no personnel, safeties, or special equipment on it, from my assistant Dr. Hopper's log, following his recovery from his prior accident. Dr. Hopper, okay, so you're going to go on that train over there. Prisoner, okay. Dr. Hopper, 
Just present your ticket and get on. There will be a man in a black suit waiting for you near the end. Prisoner. I get it already. Dr. Haber. All right, go. No, to your left. Dr. Rupert. Don't get on, stop! Dr. Haber. F. Dr. Rupert. God damn it! Package lost. Damn it! Fing son of a. Agent Ogle. Damn it, you morons. You were supposed to track him. What the hell were you doing? Dr. Haber. We were tracking him. We just lost. Shit, 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 shit. Dr. Rupert. What a senseless waste. Addendum 342G. Cessation of experimentation order. Somehow in the course of the most recent events, Dr. Haber got his neck stuck in the door when trying to help one of the subjects exit the train. As the train pulled away from the station, he was decapitated when it went past a jutting stone ledge. Because of this and other unmitigatable casualties that happen after every normal experiment, one test subject per experiment, we have decided to end our research. 058, upon our urging, has invoked Statute 62, meaning that no other teams can perform trials on the object without our permission or the overruling of all 12 overseers. We have decided to grant permission if they come to us with a novel test idea, one that has not been done before, as the usual experiments only waste lives and grant us no additional information. On a related note, several civilians have been buzzing on the topic of a haunting. Specifically, some kind of specter on the train systems that carries a mysterious bundle in its lap while riding the trains, roughly the size of a human head. We have taken in several witnesses, but under no amount of hypnosis and drugging could they give a description of the apparition's face, saying it was obscured by darkness, or tell us what was beyond the shoulders at all. Addendum 342H Excerpt from Dr. Gunther's personal log Dr. Johannes Getrim has disappeared from his house today. You can't escape, in the end. A year ago, we tried an experiment where the ticket would be torn but the rider would not get on. Dr. Getram decided to be the one to redeem the ticket, and immediately afterwards, hand it to an agent and walk away to a special on-site protection zone, keeping a journal of his experiences. The journal, attached to the file, speaks of severe anxiety, neurosis, fear, and paranoia. He had unrelenting fear of roads, and often spent the night on site so he would not have to leave. After several weeks of not leaving work and suffering the mental and physical results of that, he was sent to a psychologist for review. He brought up his research and asked to be quarantined for his own safety and others. But the way he went about his plea prejudiced many against him and sent a ripple of disgust over his pathetic antics through the office. His tactics backfired and instead, he was merely shunted off to some small project not even directly involving SCPs. The entire group was becoming more and more fed up with him, arriving late, sweating profusely, and looking disheveled because he had walked the whole way, refusing to accompany any fieldwork that involved getting there by transportation, and especially at his habit of always requesting rides home, both for personal reasons and because his car, a brand new Mercedes, kept breaking down on the way home. After attacking a tow truck driver with his own wrench for telling him he should take a bus home, he was dismissed for an undecided amount of time and confined to house arrest. This morning, thick tire tracks were found on the suburban street where he lives. He was reported missing by his wife, who remembers hearing him say, Well, I guess it's time to go. Neighbors report being woken up by the loud sound of a door opening and the sound of a large vehicle driving away. A suitcase, filled with his clothing, was found by the side of the road. Had he accepted his fate in the end enough to pack? Either way, he apparently didn't need it where he was going. Addendum 342i Excerpt from Dr. Clef's personal log At the risk of sounding melodramatic, SCP-342 has finally taken out its oldest arch-nemesis. Three days ago, Dr. Gunster and I were going through some of his old files for archival when he came across the file for SCP-342. Gunster removed 342 from its envelope and laid it on his desk as we discussed the object's history, as well as his own regrets 
for the number of lives senselessly lost in the research on this project. Our discussion was cut short by the fact that we had made an appointment to watch a showing of Repo, the genetic opera, with Drs. Wrights and Kondraki later that evening. I noticed that Dr. Gunster became somewhat perturbed shortly after presenting his ticket at the door and asked me to go on ahead and save his seat for him. He arrived shortly after and sat down next to us, although he seemed preoccupied and distressed throughout the show. Given the subject matter, I believe this to be a normal reaction to the grotesqueries on stage. Afterward, as Kondraki, Wrights, and I discussed retiring to a bar for drinks, Dr. Gunster stated that it was time for him to leave. Handing me an envelope and warning me to keep it safe, he thanked me for a splendid evening and wished me the best in my future endeavors. He then boarded a taxi cab, which sped off unusually quickly into the night. Upon opening the envelope, I noticed that there were two identical tickets for a seat at the musical, one of which transformed into a $20 bill as we approached a trendy bar with a $20 cover charge. Realizing what had happened, I then proceeded rapidly back to the place where Dr. Gunster had boarded the taxi and ran back down the street that the taxi had taken, followed closely by my confused colleagues. The street, as it turned out, was an alleyway that ended in a brick wall 50 feet from the street. No trace of Dr. Gunster has been seen since that time. It is my belief that SCP-342 took the form of Dr. Gunster's ticket to the musical, redeemed itself of the door, and thus doomed him to the same fate as its prior victims. Dr. Gunster, upon opening his wallet to purchase a beverage, realized what had happened and returned to the front door to recover SCP-342. Given the SCP's prior murderous history, he must have made the decision not to inform us of the incident, keeping us safely ignorant for the time being. When I think of the amount of mental fortitude it must have required to remain calm during the musical, knowing his inevitable fate, I am struck with a sense of loss at the passing of an inestimably valuable asset to the Foundation. For this reason, I am requesting that this file be permanently sealed and no further experiments be carried out on this item. One disturbing development. Prior reports indicate that SCP-342 can only take the form of a ticket for mass transit, whereas in this case, it took on the form of a ticket for a stage play. I understand that there is a group in the Foundation that is seeking to reopen experimentation on the object in light of these new developments. Further updates as events warrant. Item Number SCP-325 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-325 is to be held in a standard 30cm by 10cm by 10cm steel box. This box should be waterproofed and lined with hydrophobic rubber and stored away from any washing facilities. If SCP-325 breaches containment, standard Foundation issue NBC protection suits are to be used to spread desiccant on the affected area. All used desiccant should be incinerated according to standard incineration procedure. SCP-325 can be safely stored at any site and with any SCP. Any personnel showing a greatly increased adherence to cleaning and hygiene than required are to be detained and given new Foundation issue overalls to be worn for the next 24 hours. After this, suspected personnel are to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Description SCP-325 is a small bottle of washing detergent, a product commonly sold in the United Kingdom. However, the name present on the label does not match any of the company's current products. SCP-325 contains a semi-viscous green liquid, identical in chemical composition to the Naturals range of washing detergent sold by SCP-325 is a value pack container of concentrated detergent and currently contains 1,775 milliliters of fluid. One wash of SCP-325 requires 25 milliliters of liquid, as indicated on the instructions located on the rear of the bottle. This information also contains a warning detailing data expunged. SCP-325 functions in an identical way to a normal detergent, and when used will produce excellent results. Tests with Class D personnel have indicated that victims will find the quality of the wash much higher than usual. Therefore, preferring to wear a garment washed in SCP-325 over other articles of clothing, washed in normal detergent. However, 
Lab tests have shown there to be no physical or chemical difference between garments washed in SCP-325 or other brands. Further research into low-level mimetic threats are ongoing, but as the effects of SCP-325 are contained by non-use, SCP-325 is currently classified as safe. When a garment washed in SCP-325 is worn, the subject wearing it will eventually succumb to extreme pervasive paranoid delusions related to mysophobia and cleanliness. This will often induce ritualistic behaviors in the subject, and has led to subjects harming themselves through excessive cleaning methods, such as placing their hands in boiling water or ingesting bleach. There are currently five levels of behavior caused by SCP-325 exposure documented, with all tests past 480 total hours of exposure, resulting in the data expunged, indicated on the label, unless subject expires at level 4, as documented below. All time measurements indicated in the following descriptions of behavior after exposure are indicated at the average number of hours exposed, rounded up in plus or minus 10%. Exposure refers to the time spent physically wearing garments cleaned in SCP-325. Level 1 Behavior Subjects exposed to SCP-325 for between 1 and 24 hours will exhibit majorly increased awareness of hygiene and cleanliness. This is usually characterized by excessive hand washing and ordering others to be more clean themselves. This stage will usually pass without comment. However, any staff noticing increased awareness of cleanliness around the storage area of SCP-325 should inform Level 4 clearance personnel immediately. Level 2 Behavior Subjects exposed to SCP-325 for between 24 and 96 hours will begin to display extreme misophobia and manic washing regimens. Exposed subjects will also shun others only exiting their domicile to stockpile supplies of tinned food and cleaning agents, such as bleach. Interviews have shown that subjects view the outside world to be unclean. Level 3 Behavior Subjects exposed to SCP-325 for 96 to 240 hours exhibit complete disregard for anything that is considered by them to be unclean, including the outside world. If an object inside their abode can be cleaned by the subject, they will clean it until deemed suitably uncontaminated. All clothing that has not been washed in SCP-325 will also be rejected and most likely destroyed, along with other non-suitable items. Subjects will usually dispose of things by incineration, although no single method is preferred. From this point, only clothing washed in SCP-325 will be worn. Level 4 Behavior Currently the stage of most use and interest to the Foundation. After 240 hours of exposure, subjects will cut themselves in order to use their blood as a cleaning agent. Other agents such as bleach will sometimes be added, but this is not a constant behavior and around 80% of exposed subjects will not add anything. The blood from the victim has been proven to be 100% efficient at removing any contaminant from a surface. The mechanism for this is currently unknown, but tests with the products of SCP and SCP have shown promising results for cleanup after containment breaches. The composition of the blood has eluded a full analysis so far, with test results showing data expunged present in the bloodstream. Further testing is authorized after submitting Form 325-T1 to the appropriate Level 4 researcher. Most test subjects around 70%, will die of exsanguination or exhaustion before progressing to level 5. Level 5 Behavior Once a subject has been exposed for 480 hours, they will proceed to data expunged, which resulted in the deaths of several civilians and Foundation staff. This event is detailed on the warning on SCP-325's label. A copy is available to researchers above level 3 clearance. As the company shows no record of producing SCP-325, yet has the facility to do so if the is added into their manufacture process, one undercover agent has been inserted as an employee. Said agent is to stay silent, unless production of SCP-325 is found to exist. 
All instances of SCP-325 found outside of Foundation control are to be destroyed by incineration after testing at the nearest Foundation site. Field agents and MTFs are cleared to terminate any civilians exhibiting confirmed exposure of Level 3 or above. Confirmed Level 2 instances are to be contained and returned to the nearest Foundation site. Item Number SCP-305 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-305 is presently immobile. Site-305 has been constructed around its present location, a wooded canyon near and is staffed by at least seven personnel who have prior experience with SCP-305 and proved resistant to its effects. The remainder of the station crew should be rotated on a weekly basis. SCP-305's effect grows weaker if human subjects are exposed to it for extended periods of time. Therefore, a resistant subject should be exposed to it for at least three hours daily. SCP-305's effects are greatly magnified in individuals with feelings of guilt, particularly over crimes or mental instability. Therefore, Site-305 is staffed exclusively by non-D-class researchers and agents who are screened for criminal records and mental instability. Any personnel who begin to hear whispered compliments must be transferred out immediately. If symptoms persist after removal, frontal lobotomy data expunged. The actual containment chamber of SCP-305 is constructed of standard materials and offset from the rest of the station by a 5-meter buffer zone to protect normal staff from the worst of SCP-305's effects. Site-305 broadcasts a constant status normal signal to Site-19. If Site-305 becomes compromised during a containment breach, this signal will cease and a heavily armed containment team will immediately be dispatched to the location. Instances of SCP-3051 are extremely dangerous and should be terminated on site without attempting containment. As of 2000, all attempts to extract samples from SCP-305 for study are forbidden. Description SCP-305 is a rock formation of approximately humanoid size and shape. Remote recordings of SCP-305 show that it remains stationary at all times, even when interacting with human subjects. When viewed by a sentient observer, SCP-305 appears to be a mobile, animate humanoid of indeterminate sex. This manifestation is formed of cracked rock, similar to SCP-305's physical form, and while it is faceless, Subjects report that the cracks all over SCP-305's surface begin to resemble human lips and ears as it moves. Human subjects who make visual contact with this manifestation hear whispering voices, although recording equipment in the area picks up nothing, and the phenomenon is observed even in subjects who are deaf from birth. SCP-305 will initially ingratiate itself with the subject by whispering compliments. During this phase, the subject experiences feelings of friendliness and trust towards SCP-305. These sensations seem unrelated to the actual content of the compliments, which ranges from off to nonsensical and disturbing. A short list of reported compliments is included. You have beautiful eye sockets. Every one of your fingers. Your neck appears unusually flexible. In the second phase, the subject begins to hear many voices emanating from SCP-305. At this point, the whispers become critical, attempting to insult the subject or undermine the subject's self-esteem, especially by playing on the subject's guilty conscience. Like the compliments, these insults make little sense when recounted, but have a profound psychological effect, driving the subject to suicide before the final phase in 20% of cases. If the subject is removed from SCP-305's presence during Phase 2, the subject will hallucinate that these insults are emanating from mouth-like cracks that appear to form on the ground, walls, and ceiling. In the third and final phase, 
the voices will abruptly stop. Two to ten hours from the cessation of hallucinations, SCP-305's humanoid manifestation will appear and kill the subject. Causes of death are varied, but include severe cardiac infarct, muscle spasm leading to severing of the spinal column, diaphragm paralysis, and a subject who dies of any cause after the beginning of the second phase, data expunged, followed by the emergence of an instance of SCP-3051 from the corpse. SCP-3051 are humanoids, slightly smaller than SCP-305 itself. Unlike SCP-305, SCP-3051 seem to be made of a smooth, hard white substance, and the lips and mouths on their surfaces are extremely lifelike. SCP-3051 have the same abilities as SCP-305, and although they are created with a very short range of 2 meters, this range increases exponentially over time. SCP-3051 move at 30 kilometers an hour and seem naturally drawn in a direct line towards the nearest densely populated area, presumably in an attempt to further propagate themselves. SCP-3051 are highly resistant to bullets and cutting weapons. Elimination teams should be equipped with heavy ballistics and explosives. In subjects who have entered Stage 2, manifestation of SCP-3051 can only be prevented by removal of 80% data expunged. Addendum 3051 On 2000 Foundation personnel used a remote-controlled device to extract a sample of SCP-305's rock structure. SCP-305 began to emit loud grinding noises and a low growling sound. Existing cracks in the rock formation deepened, and several new ones formed in the vicinity of the removed rock sample. SCP-305 then moved its arms upward slightly and slid one foot, about 10 centimeters across the ground as if taking a step, shedding rock fragments as it moved before returning to its stationary state. Following this event, the range of SCP-305 psychic influence tripled, resulting in several data expunged. Sample proved to be ordinary sedimentary rock, consistent with the surrounding area. Follow-up X-ray scans of the formation itself reveal the presence of suggesting that the rock formation may actually be an imprisoned instance of data expunged. Upgrade to Keter requested. Pending. Item number. SCP-303. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. As SCP-303 has not yet been known to travel beyond the boundaries of Site the entire area of said location is currently considered SCP-303's containment area. All rooms in Site are to be altered where possible so as to have two entrances separated by a distance of 10 meters or line of sight. Personnel are to be distributed evenly throughout the facility with available radio or intercom contact so that encounters may be resolved quickly. Personnel who witness SCP-303 are to be submitted for immediate psychiatric evaluation. All SCP objects housed at Site since before 6410 are to be transferred to Site B, one at a time. Each SCP object will be transferred again to Site A once it can be verified that SCP-303 has not migrated from Site with it. Once SCP-303 either migrates to Site B or remains present at Site once all SCPs in question have been transferred to Site A, containment procedures will be updated as appropriate. Description Witnesses describe SCP-303 as a nude, sexless, emaciated humanoid figure with reddish-brown skin. Instead of normal facial features, its head is dominated by an extremely large mouth, which bears a set of oversized human teeth. It continually vocalizes a wheezing noise, loud enough to be heard from the other side of most solid doors. All individuals who have had encounters with SCP-303 are capable of describing it in full, including individuals who have not physically seen any part of it. 
SCP-303 will periodically materialize behind any closed door, hatch, or other entryway barrier opposite a sentient observer, chosen by unknown means. SCP-303 will then remain behind the door for an indeterminate amount of time. Any individual attempting to open the door or barrier experiences intense, paralyzing fear that lasts until SCP-303 dematerializes, either on its own or to avoid being directly seen by another observer. The source of this fear is not clear, but appears to be similar in nature to arachnophobia and aphidiophobia, originating on a pre-conscious genetic level. Data expunged. Analysis indicates that SCP-303 is not, in fact, purposefully inducing fear in the affected individuals. SCP-303 does not allow itself to come into direct visual contact with any observer. It has never allowed any one individual to view more than 10% of its form. When the door or other entryway barrier is partially or completely transparent, SCP-303 will materialize in an orientation that leaves 10% or less of its body visible, or cause effects of fog or frost on the transparent surface to achieve the same effect. If SCP-303 is approached from a direction in which there is not a solid object or door breaking line of sight, it will dematerialize before direct visual contact is made. Any electronic or complex mechanical devices that SCP-303 encounters are temporarily disabled. SCP-303 has made no recorded attempt to physically or verbally engage any observer. How SCP-303 arrived at site is not known at this time. SCP-303's first recorded appearance was on 3-1-10. It is suspected that SCP-303 was inadvertently transferred along with or manifested by another SCP on site. All SCPs at said location are being re-examined accordingly. Incident Log 303-A Incident 3031 Agent R was showering in her private quarters bathroom when she became aware of the presence of SCP-303 on the opposite side of the shower curtain. It was wheezing extremely loudly. Startled by the discovery, she accidentally struck the shower curtain, causing it to sway outwards. The curtain partially wrapped around SCP-303, revealing that it was less than 0.5 meters from the curtain, standing erect and facing the shower. Agent R reports spending approximately the next three hours sobbing in the shower, quietly, as not to disturb SCP-303. Agent R reported that the wheezing stopped very suddenly, at which point in time she was able to exit the shower. Incident 3033 Agent B encountered SCP-303 inside the site second floor break room. He was attempting to obtain coffee creamer from the counter cabinet when he heard loud wheezing emanating from the cabinet and was overtaken by overwhelming fear. Agent B later reported that SCP-303 was huddled in the cabinet in the fetal position. Agent B claimed to be certain of the information, despite failing to open the cabinet door. Later, when the cabinet was examined, one container of powdered coffee creamer was missing. Note. This is the first recorded instance of SCP-303 removing an object from a scene. Incident 3036 Dr. was discovered dead from dehydration in a second floor storage room. It is estimated that said doctor spent up to five days in the storage room before being discovered. A small 4 meter by 4 meter decompression chamber separated the storage room from the adjoining hallway. SCP-303 occupied the decompression chamber for the duration of Dr. Brandt's isolation in the storage room, disallowing entry from either direction and making it impossible for the doctor to leave. Test Log 303-A A team consisting of Dr. G, Researcher M, four security personnel, and four D-Class personnel were assigned to be dispatched to any reported incident of SCP-303's materialization in order to immediately perform on-site testing. These logs take place at the door to room from the first floor hallway. 
SCP-303 was reported to be within room Test 3031 One male D-Class personnel, D-3031, was ordered to open the door and threatened that he would be transferred to SCP duty for non-compliance. He refused, citing extreme fear. Test 3032 One male D-Class personnel, D-3031, was ordered to open the door and threatened that he would be terminated on the spot for non-compliance. He refused, claiming that if he were to do so, that SCP-303 would data expunged. He was terminated on the spot. Test 3033 One female D-Class personnel, D-3032, that had witnessed the termination of D-3031, was ordered to open the door and threatened that she would be terminated on the spot for non-compliance. She refused claiming that if she opened the door, that SCP-303 would data expunged. Researcher T was visibly shaken by this claim. D-3032 was not terminated. Test 3034 One female D-Class personnel, D-3032, was ordered to open the door. One male D-Class personnel, D-3033, was given one combat knife by security personnel and ordered to data expunged until D-3032 opened the door. After two hours of data expunged, D-3032 died from blood loss. D-3032 made no attempt to open the door. Addendum 5110 SCP-303 appears to have claimed the second floor storage room as its own. It has so far disallowed any personnel entry to the room since 4-5-10. It leaves periodically to acquire Foundation property, which is then moved into the second floor storage room. To date, the following list describes all non-classified items taken by SCP-303. 1. Cryotube 3 sets of standard Foundation surgical equipment Data expunged Two D-Class research cadavers. One gasoline-powered generator. A variety of chemicals, including large quantities of tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, among others. And one container of powdered coffee creamer. In addition to this, a number of classified materials have been obtained by SCP-303. Staff are still attempting to determine what specific purposes SCP-303 may have for these materials. Item Number SCP-316 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-316 needs no special containment, other than to prevent misuse by unauthorized personnel. Those operating SCP-316 should wear highly reflective full-body wear to prevent accidental exposure. Personnel privy to sensitive information should be kept out of visual range of SCP-316 due to its ability to induce a suggestive state. Description: SCP-316 is a bronze-aged carbide lamp. The casing corresponds to no manufactured models and appears to be homemade. The bulb is ordinary and can be replaced without impeding the function of SCP-316. Internal circuitry of SCP-316 is constructed of an unknown metal rather than copper. The casing has a battery compartment, which takes 2D batteries. SCP-316 does not function unless 2D batteries are in the battery compartment with their positive ends facing each other. When switched on, SCP-316's bulb emits a nearly opaque beam of white light. Non-reflective objects and materials in contact with this light have their molecular structure rearranged into patterns which homogenize reflected photons, distributing their wavelengths equally throughout the visual spectrum. Effectively, over approximately six cumulative seconds of exposure, affected surfaces lose all color retaining shades of gray of the same luminosity as the original surface. Reflective surfaces remain unaffected, 
but appear to stop SCP-316's light rather than reflecting it. SCP-316 has a temporary but more drastic effect on living or sentient organisms. Its effect is spread evenly across an organism, even internally, as long as part of the organism is exposed to its light. Effects set in over approximately 27 cumulative seconds of exposure and gradually wear off over the next 24 hours. In addition to loss of color, most affected organisms experience the following. Color blindness. Lower body temperature. Low energy. Slowed movements. Monotonic slurred speech. Inattentiveness. Short-term memory loss. Apathy. Lack of aggression. Negligible emotional response. Passive cooperation with instructions. Relative lack of desire to lie or deceive. Limited capacity for foresight or creative thought. After recovering from the effects of SCP-316, most subjects report symptoms of nausea and depression for up to one week. Almost all subjects, once recovered, volunteer their displeasure at having been exposed to SCP-316 and may violently resist further exposure. Cross-experimentation between SCP-316 and uncooperative living SCPs for the purposes of pacification has been approved. Addendum 316A SCP-316 was recovered from the residence of a colorblind man arrested for counterfeiting in Texas. The man had reportedly attempted to pay for items at a convenience store with colorless bills. A Secret Service investigator noted the apparent quality and validity of the bills, as well as the ink's chemical equivalency with Federal Ink, and the Foundation investigated. The subject's house was mostly colorless, as it seemed he had been using SCP-316 to navigate at night. Neighbors reported the subject to have been withdrawn and depressingly dull. Subject was terminated and his property destroyed. Addendum 316B Experiment Log of Dr. Blast Testing SCP-316 on Sentient SCPs Date Undisclosed Exposure to Aggressive Humanoid SCPs Experiment 1 Exposure to SCP-213 Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 25 seconds of exposure. SCP-213 exhibits normal symptoms of exposure. Subject is still able to disintegrate matter when ordered to do so, but to a diminished extent, approximately 9% normal speed. Testing concluded. After recovery, subject shows a willingness to comply with Foundation commands to avoid future exposure to SCP-316. Note, my heart nearly jumped out when he started melting matter, but scares aside, this test has proven very useful. We can use SCP-316 to ensure cooperation when these SCPs disagree with us, and then hold it over their heads like a whip when they think of doing it again. Dr. Blast Experiment 2 Exposure to SCP-076-2 Able Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 30 seconds of exposure. SCP-076-2 enters a catatonic stupor, still upright. At 49 seconds, subject proceeds to dispassionately kill all nearby personnel. Kill switch activated remotely by Dr. Blast. Assistants to Dr. Blast note him hammering kill switch frantically for up to 16 seconds after SCP-076-2 was pacified. Testing suspended. After revival, when questioned, SCP-076-2 remarked that SCP-316 had made him feel extremely bored. What else was I supposed to do? Note, Jesus, I guess monsters don't react the same way to this thing. It's a good thing I opted to stay in Site-17 during the procedure. Dr. Blast Note, Dr. Blast will be supervising all further SCP-316 testing remotely, as with the previous procedure. Data expunged. Experiment 5 Exposure to SCP-56 
Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 30 seconds of exposure. SCP-56 changes into a gray replica of one of the researchers in the testing room, shifting between several of them as tests are conducted. Personality and effects of subject remain unchanged. Only the physical form appears to be affected. As researchers read out results for Dr. Blast, viewing remotely via camera, SCP-56 takes the form of Dr. Blast. Microphone in Dr. Blast's area records him shouting an expletive and falling over with his chair. Testing concluded. Note. Nobody told me this thing could breach camera transmissions. I've probably been mentally breached as well. I can feel it already, damn it. My head's probably going to explode. This thing can destroy brains, right? Who the hell designed 56's containment procedures anyway? Damn it. I can't move. I can't f***ing move. Wheel me down to the infirmary. Hurry! Dr. Blast. Note. Medical personnel found no physical or mental problems with Dr. Blast. Research assistant has requested a transfer. Data expunged. Experiment 8. Exposure to SCP-343. Data expunged and riots in Italy, which data expunged. Effects of in Site 17. Dr. Blast informed of results after regaining consciousness. Further testing attempts suspended. Note. As we informed you the sixth time, Dr. Blast, under no conditions are we approving your emergency transfer requests. O5. Note. What the fuck is he doing with a safe classification? Tell O5 I'm not supervising tests on anything outside of my security clearance again, damn it. Dr. Blast. Experiment 9. Exposure to SCP-6621. Mr. Deeds. Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 28 seconds of exposure, to which the subject exhibits normal symptoms. Subject is asked to explain his origin and other previously unobtainable information. Subject remains silent and unresponsive. Administering researcher asks subject to obtain a glass of lemonade, to which he responds that he is tired and would rather not. Researcher insists. Subject leaves in the expected manner and returns with a glass on a tray, which is empty, save for three cubes of ice and a wedge of lemon. Upon questioning, subject responds that he was thirsty. When dismissed and summoned again with SCP-662, subject returns free of symptoms and immediately apologizes to researcher for his unprofessional conduct. When asked about the effects of exposure to SCP-316, subject replied that they were unpleasant. Testing concluded. Note. Cheeky bastard. Dr. Blast. Awaiting declassification. Item number. SCP-323. Object class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-323 is to be kept in a 17 meter by 17 meter by 17 meter concrete containment cell in Site-91. The object is to be restrained in the center of the cell within a 1 meter cubed container of 8.8 .8 centimeter thick transparent armor lined with one-way laminate, which is to be fit with one electronically locked access port. This container is to be internally lit, with the surrounding cell kept dimmer to facilitate the one-way laminate. The cell is to be surveyed remotely at all times, and any signs of activity are to be reported. No personnel are to enter SCP-323's containment cell, except to examine the integrity of SCP-323's restraint measures. The restraint measures are to be examined bi-weekly, and any signs of damage are to be repaired immediately. All personnel who enter SCP-323's containment cell are to be accompanied by an armed guard. Personnel are not to be within SCP-323's containment cell for longer than 45 minutes, and any communication around SCP-323 is to be written or spoken in a language other than English or French. In the event that SCP-323 breaches containment and an instance of SCP-3231 is formed, Personnel are to evacuate Site-91, and the site is to be locked down. 
Remote units are to be deployed to destroy the body of SCP-3231. Following this, armed personnel may be sent in to re-establish the containment of SCP-323. Description SCP-323 is the skull of an unidentified cervid, measuring 55 centimeters long, 27 centimeters wide, and 31 centimeters tall, with a pair of antlers, measuring 35 centimeters tall and 46 centimeters from tip to tip, growing from the left and right sides of SCP-323. SCP-323 shows signs of damage consistent with outside exposure, with regular pitting, scarring, and weathering across the object, bleaching on the upper surfaces, and a missing lower mandible. The rear of the skull features an approximately centered ovoid gap, measuring 25 centimeters high and 23 centimeters wide, giving access to an interior space 16 centimeters deep. This gap shows signs of tool use, indicating that it was carved with tools, possibly stone. SCP-323 displays the ability to react to oral, tactile, and visual stimuli. Testing has revealed SCP-323 appears to have a field of view similar to that of other servants, and has responded to visual stimuli from up to 50 meters away. The targeting of specific members of personnel, various attempts to breach containment, and the violent reaction towards speakers of the French and English languages suggests a level of sapience. However, this is unconfirmed. SCP-323 is capable of limited locomotion, typically in the form of small movements and vibrations. In most cases, SCP-323 will only locomote in the event of various stimuli, such as moving away when touched, or turning when personnel are present within its containment chamber. SCP-323 has demonstrated the ability to make larger movements, such as lunging at personnel and repeatedly attempting to force its way through containment measures. SCP-323 exerts an influential effect in a radius extending roughly 15 meters from itself. Individuals within this radius will begin experiencing cannibalistic thoughts and urges, violent outbursts, and impaired judgment after approximately one hour of continuous exposure. Roughly 74% of individuals who reach this point will attempt to place their heads through the gap present in the back of SCP-323, with efforts made to keep their mouths uncovered. If an individual is incapable of fitting their heads through the gap, attempts will be made to bludgeon their heads against nearby hard surfaces, until the point the individual's head fits, the individual loses consciousness, or the individual expires. Once the individual has fit their head through SCP-323, the individual is classified as SCP-3231. Within 10 minutes of putting SCP-323 on, SCP-3231 will undergo drastic physical alterations. SCP-3231 will experience a rapid loss of body fat, body hair, and pigmentation, followed by the rupturing of the distal phalanges from the fingertips, abnormal tooth growth, and the blackening of extremities consistent with frostbite. Additionally, SCP-3231 appears to experience greater strength and pain tolerance than the average human. However, SCP-3231 still appears to be as susceptible to physical harm as it was prior to its introduction to SCP-323. SCP-3231's metabolism will experience a dramatic increase, requiring a constant caloric intake with starvation occurring anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes if no self-preservation efforts are made. In order to sustain its increased metabolism, SCP-3231 will actively seek out and eat other individuals for sustenance until expiration. In the event SCP-3231 is incapable of finding plentiful nourishment, SCP-3231 will make efforts to sustain itself, including limiting movement, rationing available food, and auto-cannibalism. SCP-3231 will only feed upon humans. It is presumed that SCP-3231 is capable of receiving sustenance from other sources, but chooses not to, despite availability or ease of access. During the pursuit of individuals, SCP-3231 has been known to occasionally make various statements in the Severn Ojibwe, 
Potawatomi and Cree languages, as well as in the native language of the instance. It is not known if these statements in the knowledge of these languages is the result of SCP-323's anomalous influence, or if they originate from SCP-323 itself. Recovered Audio Log Incident SCP-323-B752Z4-110906 the following audio log has been transcribed from surveillance recovered during the 110906 containment breach of SCP-323, which resulted in the death of 12 personnel members before containment could be re-established. No accompanying video surveillance could be recovered. SCP-3231 Hungry. So hungry. The sound of dragging can be heard, as SCP-3231's voice becomes louder. SCP-3231 I must eat so very hungry always always hungry several thumps can be heard followed by a wet crack SCP-3231 must not eat I have to eat so hungry so lonely what is presumed to be SCP-3231 eating can be heard, accompanied by what sounds like panting. SCP-3231 Alone. Hungry. Should. Eat. Must. Must. Eat them all. I must eat. To know. Warmth. SCP-3231 creates a loud vocalization, followed by a wet thump. SCP-3231 so cold. Must eat. SCP-323 was recovered on 091297 in the Bittern Lake Reserve, part of the Lac La Ronge First Nation in Saskatchewan, Canada. A small, unregistered community had been sustaining an active SCP-3231 instance by routinely murdering individuals and leaving them out as an appeasement. Investigation revealed individuals were involved, who were interviewed and subsequently administered amnestics, and a cover story involving an unidentified serial killer was propagated. SCP-3231, at the time suspected to be the anomaly, died of starvation during its transfer to Site-91. The recorded number of deaths does not appear consistent with the duration of the SCP-3231 instance. It is suspected SCP-323 went through several instances of SCP-3231 before containment. However, no irrefutable evidence supporting SCP-3231's longevity has been uncovered. Interview SCP-323-A James Namagus, an individual involved in the murders and sustaining of SCP-3231 prior to its containment was brought in for questioning involving SCP-3231. Mr. Namagus remained unusually calm throughout and after the interview. Following the interview and containment of SCP-323, Mr. Namagus was administered amnestics and was reintroduced to his community. Doctor, please state your name for the record. Namagus. James Namagus. Doctor, please state your involvement with the murders. Namagus, I helped move the bodies for the Wendigo to eat. Doctor, what do you know about the object? Namagus, there is a story of the Cree men, back when fighting was common, who tried to control the Wendigo to give his people an advantage. It was just a story. The elders knew more, but we were safe, so we didn't ask. Doctor, when did you first encounter the entity? Namagus. One night, I heard yelling all around the village. A warped man walked out of the woods, killed our friends right in front of us. Sometimes it would stare more than it would make to kill, try to talk to you. It whispered at me, Pemisto, come and eat. It made me cold in my bones. Doctor. And then? Namagus. Then, I felt like I could understand the warped man, the Wendigo and that we could leave with him like we all do when we pass. When I was made to kill, I thought of this, and it calmed me. I didn't run. 
Mr. Namagoose closes his eyes and exhales slowly. After a minute, he resumes talking. Namagoose. It would look at me sometimes. I could hear him in my mind. I could feel him watching me from out of my own eyes. This helped me watch these people die, and I hoped it would pass on my family. Doctor, thank you, Mr. Namagoose. Final note. No mental effects similar to what Mr. Namagoose stated have yet to be reported by staff who have interacted with SCP-323 or SCP-3231. Further investigation into this is not planned. However, staff are encouraged to report any atypical thoughts or feelings experienced while working with either. Item Number SCP-373 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-373 is to be kept in a containment locker at Site-38. Research into SCP-373 and SCP-373-A iterations is to be carried out by authorized personnel. Grounds for immediate revocations of testing privileges include, but are not limited to, recent loss of loved ones, testing privileges suspended for five years, any history of abuse or inability to follow orders as per containment procedures for other SCPs, testing privileges revoked permanently, any past association with paranormal research or investigative groups. Testing privileges revoked until approval given by site director. Or any unusual or persistent interest or obsession with SCP-373. Testing privileges revoked permanently. Note from head researcher... The potential implications of this device for both SCP-373-A entities and their former loved ones require a certain degree of composure with regard to its use. Quite frankly, we may be creating these beings rather than channeling them. Personnel unable to react responsibly with that degree of power are not to be allowed access. Note from head researcher Testing with D-Class personnel to be carried out as per Addendum 3734. For maximum efficiency in gathering intelligence regarding SCP-373-A entities, all records used with SCP-373 should be 33.5 RPM vinyl albums, with lyric-heavy songs or spoken word tracks, audiobooks, comedy albums, and other principally speech-based records are encouraged. Principally instrumental or orchestral music is forbidden. Description SCP-373 is an antique disc phonograph player. Markings on the machine indicate it was built in 19... An additional label indicates that the device was modified in late 1940 at a facility called Laboratories, Inc. The device is composed of a crank-operated turntable embedded in a wooden case, a tone arm with an aluminum stylus, and a slightly tarnished silver horn. SCP-373 appears to have the ability to modify the audio of any record player on it according to particular patterns. Specifically, Research has demonstrated that approximately every fourth word or phrase will be altered from the originally recorded song or monologue. These new words can be organized sequentially to reveal what appear to be messages or statements from a series of unknown entities. These entities have been named SCP-373-AX, with X to be replaced with a numerical identification as entities are discovered. The entity is able to communicate for the duration of each instance of the playing of the record. Upon the next playing of the same record, the same entity will be speaking, but will claim not to recall the previous conversation. Due to the stilted nature of the communication, it is rare for the entities to communicate any significant amount of information to Foundation researchers before the end of the record. However, research has demonstrated that two-way communication is possible by lifting the needle from the record while it spins and speaking into the horn. Any attempt at useful communication requires both parties speak while the record spins at the speed at which optimal playback was intended. All SCP-373-A entities report that speaking into the horn with the record slowed or stopped results in a high-pitched squeal for the entity, and vice versa. Testing with anomalies such as SCP-043 and SCP-1668 did not initially produce data. However, 
Analysis of audio taken during testing has shown the presence of at least two distinct breathing patterns being broadcast from SCP-373. Further scheduled testing is currently under consideration. Addendum 3731 Abridged Log of SCP-373-A Entities Entity SCP-373-A-3 Run-through number 1 Record Painkiller by Judas Priest Notes An early attempt at scientific analysis of the phenomenon. Both the choice of music and questions were largely arbitrary. Two-way communication not yet understood. Full lyrical output is included below to demonstrate effect. All future entries will include only relevant utterances. Results Playing of track 1, Painkiller, resulted in the following lyrical output. Faster than a hello, terrifying scream. Enraged hello, full of anger. Who's half man and there, machine. Rides the metal can, breathing smoke and anybody. Closing in with here, soaring high. He is me, painkiller. This is is, painkiller. Planets devastated. Mankind's this, its knees. A savior what? From out the skies. Hell, answer to there is. Through boiling clouds, I thunder. Blasting bolts don't steal. Evil's going under, no, wheels. He is what? Painkiller. This is I've painkiller. Faster than a dun, bullet. Louder than an please, bomb. Chromium plated, it's metal. Brighter than a so, suns. Flying high on dark. Stronger free and and. Never more encaptured. Cold. Been brought back here. The grave. Entity. SCP-373-A3. Run through. 8. Record. Painkiller by Judas Priest. Notes. First consistent and notable demonstration of two-way communicative potential. Communication redacted to relevant utterances for convenience. Result. The following interview was carried out by researcher Kim with entity SCP-373-A3. Kim. Speaking as record begins. Needle up. Hello. Please try to stay calm. You've had an accident, and we are working to save you. Can you tell us your name? SCP-373-A3. Hello. Oh, thank goodness. I thought I had died. Kim, could you please tell us your name? SCP-373-A3. My name is Mary Turner. I had a dream. I thought they hanged. Kim, you're okay, Mary. Can you tell me what you see? SCP-373-A3. All dark. No light. Just your voice. Please help. Kim, we're very close to getting you out. Just hold on tight. Can you tell me where you live and what day it is? SCP-373-A3. Valdosta in Folsom County. Is my baby okay? Kim, it's fine, ma'am. Can you tell me what year it is? SCP-373-A3. What you mean? It's 1918. The record ends. Flipping the record results in the conversation beginning again, as in all other tests. Entity number. SCP-373-A24. Run through. Two. Record. Item Pi 2. Notes. Item Pi 2 is a vinyl record pressed by Site-38 for testing purposes, consisting of a rapid, though clearly audible, reading of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. The speed at which the book is read allows for approximately 720 words per minute, increasing the potential conversational ability of the ensuing SCP-373-A entity. Result. The following is the interview between researcher Kim and SCP-373-A24. Kim. Hello. There's been an accident. We're trying to get you out, but we need you to remain calm. 
Can you tell us what the last thing is that you remember? SCP 373 A 24. Harry, is that you? Kim, I'm sorry. I can't understand you. What is the last thing you were doing? SCP 373 A 24. Harry, it's me. It's Susan. The car skidded on the ice. Where are you? Kim, appearing distressed. Wait, Susan? Susan? Oh my god, Susan. Are you in here? Assistant Researcher Lucas. Harry, we can't tell them. Kim, that's her, Joey. That's my wife in there. To SCP-373. Sweetie, it's me. Oh god, you've been gone for almost a year, but you're back now. Lucas. Security, we need security in here. He's losing it. Attempts to restrain researcher Kim. Kim, knocking down Lucas, grabbing SCP-373's horn, shaking. I'm going to get you out of there. Just wait. Several agents enter the room and drag researcher Kim out by force, knocking SCP-373 to the ground in the process. Experiment ends. Damage to SCP-373 repaired. Researcher Lucas's injuries were treated. Researcher Kim's attack against Foundation agents attempting to restrain him led to his termination. Addendum 3732 SCP-373 entities have been showing a greater tendency to present themselves as relatives or close friends of Foundation personnel in the last two months. This has begun to take place in spite of deliberate efforts to choose records at random. Statistical probability suggests it to be highly unlikely that we have been selecting these particular individuals without some influence on the part of SCP-373, requesting a halt to testing until a pattern can be discerned. Researcher Lucas Addendum 3733 Request approved Head Researcher Addendum 3734 Four different researchers have been caught over the last three weeks attempting to access SCP-373 for personal purposes. In one instance, a researcher successfully began to use a record already believed to contain one SCP-373-A entity, at which point he was able to communicate with his deceased daughter. Present opinion among Site-38 Command is that SCP-373 is deliberately manipulating its users into emotional distress. Additionally, given the disregard for security protocols being shown now by experienced Foundation researchers, in the face of SCP-373, we are forced to conclude that the object becomes increasingly determined to force individuals to use it as time passes between usage, much in the way predators become increasingly desperate as time passes after feeding. Suggesting that D-Class personnel be allowed to use SCP-373 twice weekly in order to prevent further deterioration of conditions here. Researcher Lucas Addendum 3735 Request approved Head Researcher Item Number SCP-332 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Observation Station 55B has been constructed to monitor and study SCP-332. Fences designed to contain SCP-332's stationary effect have been demolished and replaced by a research station dedicated to observing SCP-332 in its dormant state. When SCP-332 enters its active state, all site personnel are to monitor the length and intensity of the sound produced by SCP-332 from soundproofed observation areas until the active state ceases. Any affected civilians are to be detained indefinitely under the cover of an infectious disease outbreak. SCP-1833 has been placed under constant observation in case of any alterations. Description SCP-332 is the class of 1976 Kirk Lawnwood High School Marching Band, located in the town of the band is composed of 30 humanoids, known as SCP-332-1-30. through 30. All 30 instances of SCP-332 wear 1976 band uniforms and play instruments manufactured before 1976. The words Syncope Symphony 
have been engraved into each instrument. Individuals within SCP-332 do not display normal human behavior and will stand at attention in the center of the former Kirk Lawnwood High School football field. Occasionally, individual instances of SCP-332 have been known to suddenly begin struggling with an unseen force before returning to their normal stance. The reason for this behavior is unknown. No instance of SCP-332 has ever attempted to communicate with Foundation personnel. Instances of SCP-332 do not appear to feel hunger, pain, or suffer from exposure to the elements, and were observed to stand in the same location for over 30 years. Once every 48 hours, SCP-332 will enter an active state. While active, SCP-332 will perform a marching routine. Music played by SCP-332 varies, but it primarily consists of marching arrangements popular between 1967 and 1976. Sounds produced by SCP-332 have a consistent volume throughout the active zone, with the sound fading abruptly outside of that zone. If a subject is able to hear the music played by SCP-332, they will attempt to obtain any instrument near them and join SCP-332 in playing. Subjects affected in this manner, hereafter known as SCP-332-B, will report high amounts of anxiety if unable to obtain a musical instrument within 10 minutes of coming under SCP-332's effect. If they are unable to join SCP-332 within 10 minutes, they will walk with the band and begin miming an instrument as they march with the band and will attempt to replicate the sound being produced by SCP-332 with their voice. Instances of SCP-332-B who join with SCP-332 will march and play until they pass out from exhaustion or hunger, at which point they will be trampled by other instances of SCP-332-B and SCP-332. For every 10 SCP-332-B instances who join SCP-332, the area of effect will increase by 300 meters. This radius of effect will expand until all instances of SCP-332-B are terminated or incapacitated, at which point SCP-332's active state will immediately cease. SCP-332 was contained following Incident 332-A, the incident during which SCP-332 was initially activated. Between the point from when it activated to being disabled by Foundation agents, Incident 332-A resulted in the deaths of 40% of Kirk Lawnwood High School's staff and students. The school was closed down under the pretense of fire damage, with students, locals, and survivors being issued Class B amnesics. Successful containment for SCP-332 was achieved on 7-19-1976 with a classification of Euclid. Addendum 332-B Transcript of Incident 332-A During initial cleanup operations following SCP-332's containment, a 16mm camera was discovered outside what would have been the first story window of Kirk Lawnwood High School. The transcript of this video, although highly corrupted, is the only record of Incident 332-A. Begin Log 0 to 10 seconds The camera is pointed out a large window believed to be in the school's front office. Several members of SCP-332 can be seen preparing their instruments on the field. There is no sound. 10 seconds to a minute 34. The camera swings towards unidentified woman number one. It is believed that the cameraman is speaking to her, although no sound can be heard. One of SCP-332's clarinet players can be seen walking by in the background. Minute 34 to 4 minutes and 55 seconds. Section of the tape is damaged. No identifiable content present. 4 minutes 55 seconds to 5 minutes. Picture and sound briefly become clear, and a voice believed to belong to unidentified woman number 1 remarks about one band member's outfit having an unusual attribute, although what was unusual about it is not heard. 5 minutes to 6 minutes and 2 seconds. Static. 6 minutes and 2 seconds to 8 minutes and 4 seconds. Sound and picture return with greatly improved quality, with the cameraman chatting with unidentified woman number 1. Unidentified woman number 2 is heard off screen at 7 minutes and 9 seconds, referencing a band equipment supplier known as Syncope Symphony, 
and remarking that she was unable to find it with the information that was provided to her. Unidentified man number one, also in the background, claims that he will investigate it at a later date. 8 minutes and 4 seconds to 16 minutes and 22 seconds. Sound cuts out again. Camera is pointed out to the field as SCP-332 begins to perform. At the 11 minute mark, several persons in the audience begin to exhibit signs of distress. At the 11.30 minute mark, the camera is violently jerked away from the floor and dropped. Several persons, including the cameraman and unidentified woman number two, are seen to move around the office in a state of distress. At the 11.45 mark, SCP-332 enters an active state. Unidentified woman number one is seen to exit the office to go outside at the 16 minute mark. 16 minutes 22 seconds to 18 minutes and 45 seconds. Static. 18.45 to 19 minutes. The camera is picked up and pans around the room. Several seemingly deceased persons are visible in frame, including the original cameraman. The camera is briefly pointed out the window, where SCP-332 can be seen playing. The tape ends at the 19 minute mark. End log. Item number. SCP-343 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-343 resides in a 6.1 meter by 6.1 meter, or 20 feet by 20 feet, room at Minimal Security Site 17. It should be brought any items it requests, and visited by at least one staff member each day. Attempts to add further safety precautions or required clearances are unnecessary, or impossible, due to the nature of SCP-343. Description SCP-343 is a male, seemingly raceless, humanoid in appearance with apparent omnipotence. SCP-343 was discovered walking the streets of Prague and detained after a staff member witnessed him disappear from the streets and reappear on a rooftop. SCP-343 is detained willingly in his chamber, as containment has proved impossible. Addendum number 3431 SCP-343, colloquially nicknamed God by the staff here, looks like an older man, although his features are different to each observer. In my first talk with him, he claimed outright to be the creator of the universe. When I asked him to prove this, he laughed, walked through the wall of the chamber, and returned seconds later with a hamburger in his hand. When I returned for a second visit, the previously bare cell had been furnished in upscale Old English style, complete with a roaring fireplace, and seemed many times larger than it did from the exterior. SCP-343 greatly enjoys speaking with people, and seems to have a knowledge of all topics. Visiting with SCP-343 has become a daily event for many of the staff here and all employees report feeling generally happier after each visit. Attempts to bar staff below level 3 clearance have proven unsuccessful, as guards assigned to watch the room quit their posts, saying, you know he likes company, or shrugging when questioned. Since SCP-343 has thus far been harmless, all staff have been allowed access, and somehow they all have time to meet with him for as long as they need. For now, I leave this report open as further questioning of SCP-343 is ongoing. Dr. Beck Warning, security level 4 or higher needed for further access. Addendum number 3432 In regards to document 3431A, there are no relevant records available, or seemingly in existence, and, similarly, all records of Dr. ever working with SCP-343 or Dr. Beck are missing and presumed non-existent. All staff questioned about the document convey ignorance of document number 3431A and claim not to have met Dr. In a related matter, Senior Officer Dr. Beck has requested a higher staff rotation to increase morale in worse-off sections. This is a very odd request and was the subject of further investigation. Other localized anomalies, such as better health, greater job satisfaction, and lower fatalities in this section have led to the request being granted. This subject is now closed, on orders of 05 Addendum number 3433 
Data recovered from routine check of Dr. Brown's network drive. Document number 3431A. Data lost. As of data expunged, visitors of SCP-343 are to be questioned as to their intent in converse data lost. Questions pertaining to other SCP are to be put forth data lost. Orders of Dr. Document number 3431B. Data lost. Apparently my orders have gone missing. This is the last straw, Dr. B. Data lost. All my reports and requests to higher-ups have gone unnoticed. I will confront SCP-343 tomorrow. Signed, Dr. Item number, SCP-350. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. When not under experimentation, SCP-350 should be contained within a locked storage unit. No personnel other than those undergoing experimentation with SCP-350 should be allowed to sign SCP-350, no matter what might be offered in exchange. Those who have signed SCP-350 should be allowed to fulfill the terms of SCP-350 until the terms conflict with Foundation interests, at which point they should be restrained or terminated as necessary. Any staff member above Level 3 caught signing SCP-350 for any reason must be immediately terminated. Description SCP-350 appears to be a single-page contract, followed by 49 blank sheets. The contract outlines a basic exchange of a good or service, in exchange for a small amount of money wired to a numbered account at Bank in Zurich, Switzerland. The wording of SCP-350 is different to every reader prior to signature, and the good or service offered is always something the subject has expressed great desire to obtain. The document is also always in the native language of the reader, and conforms to the laws of the nation in which the subject makes their primary residence. Attempts to use video or photography to get an objective image of SCP-350 at this stage have failed, as the text continues to vary from person to person. Upon signing of SCP-350, the variable language property of the contract ceases and the text of the contract stays in the language of the owner of the signature on the document to all readers. The subject will invariably find the object or a proof of service shortly after exiting SCP-350's containment unit, always in a location without direct surveillance. Should the signatory of SCP-350 fulfill the terms of the contract and wire the money to the bank account, SCP-350 begins to add new amendments and terms starting from the second page most of which demand a minor service of some form from the signatory. However, the complexity of the terms and demands increases with the number of amendments fulfilled, eventually reaching extremes including but not limited to the murder of staff members, the removal of SCP-350 from Foundation containment, and even data expunged. Should the signatory not fulfill the original or new terms of SCP-350 for any reason for a full week, they will begin to feel a noticeable urge to complete the current task. This grows into a compulsion on the order of the ticks of those suffering from severe obsessive compulsive disorder. Should the subject be prevented from completing the terms at this point, the subject will begin to lie, steal, kill, and take other extreme actions to attempt to fulfill the demands of the contract. Psychological analysis at this point reveals nothing as the subject is utterly fixated on completing the task, to the exclusion of all else. If the subject is restrained from completing the task, the subject will resort to constant escape attempts, refusing to eat, drink, or sleep. Subjects will die unless placed on intravenous fluids and forced into a chemically induced coma. At this point, their metabolism and bodily functions will begin to speed up until the subject dies from either a heart attack or the inability of intravenous therapy equipment to keep up with the metabolism. Item Number SCP-358 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to the mental side effects of SCP-358, SCP-358 is to be kept locked at all times except during testing, and all windows are to remain boarded, with regular guard patrols to ensure that no unauthorized entry occurs. The entirety of the building should be sealed airtight, and any leaks reported immediately 
along with any signs of forced entry. Anyone found inside the building with reasons other than testing should be evacuated immediately and held for questioning and observation. Description SCP-358 is an abandoned trauma center located on the outskirts of England. The grounds surrounding the building are overgrown with vegetation native to the area and characteristic of extreme neglect. The building's exterior is weathered but otherwise intact, with windows and entrances boarded up to prevent trespassing and vandalism. Air inside is arid, measured on average at 45 degrees Celsius, with hotter dry gusts of air that blow through the hallways from no discernible source. Exploration and monitoring has revealed anomalous activity, characteristic of typical Type 3 pseudo-spiritual manifestation. Haunting. Ranging from glowing spheres to full-bodied apparitions, all of which appear exhausted and on occasion ask for water. Recognizable apparitions appear to be individuals who have been exposed to SCP-358 beyond the average 47-minute psychological recoverability point in the past. The majority of these subjects reside in Foundation psychological observational facilities and security footage shows them present in their respective units during the appearance of their apparitions within SCP-358. In the majority of cases, individuals within SCP-358 experience a sense of disorientation upon entering the building, which slowly diminishes over time spent within SCP-358. Additionally, they report a growing sense of thirst, which begins to coincide with physical symptoms suggestive of extreme dehydration and heat exhaustion. These symptoms are not alleviated by hydration, even using a direct intravenous drip. As exposure time continues, the exposed individual will show a slowly increasing degree of mental degradation, typical of heat stroke, which leads to an exponentially increasing degree of disassociative disorder. On average, Affected individuals remaining within SCP-358 are not considered psychologically recoverable beyond 47 minutes of exposure. The remaining percent of subjects exposed to SCP-358 are unaffected, but are to be kept under observation to monitor for possible later development of effects. On rare occasions, affected subjects within SCP-358 expire suddenly of apparent poisoning. Autopsy in these cases always reveals the venom of one or more common North American desert-dwelling predators in the bloodstream, usually that of Crotalus atrox, the western diamondback rattlesnake. SCP-358 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on 1983, when two males, ages 20 and 22, were apprehended for trespassing after being found wandering its premises, unaware of their surroundings by local law enforcement. Medical examination revealed only physical side effects, similar to exposure to a desert setting. The psychological evaluations of each person revealed a loss in mental capacity regarding self-identification and location. A follow-up of a CT scan revealed nothing out of the ordinary. The police and medical reports were collected by SCP Foundation personnel, which led to the current testing of SCP-358. Addendum 3581 Testing Supervisor's Log Date Undisclosed Testing Time Duration 30 Minutes Test Subject is Female Age and Height Expunged With an Athletic Build Upon Entry, Test Subject observes that the climate is hot and dry. After exiting the building, the Test Subject appeared dazed and was observed to be suffering from slight dehydration. Test subject also brought attention to the sand in her shoes. The sand was then collected for further testing purposes. Addendum 3582 Testing Supervisor's Log Date Undisclosed Testing Time Duration 1 Hour Test subject is male, age and height expunged, slightly overweight. Test subject entered the building as in the previous test, remarking on the arid climate inside. Further exploration revealed a layout not unlike that of any other hospital from the region and period. Upon exiting SCP-358, test subject began questioning who and where they were. Medical testing revealed that the subject was suffering from dehydration 
and they were provided water to replenish lost fluids. Sand was recovered from the test subject's shoes. Test subject recovered fully in all areas, except their mental state, and remains in Psychological Observation Facility A. Addendum 3583 Testing Supervisor's Log Date Undisclosed Testing Time Duration 2 Hours Test Subject is Male Age and Height Expunged of a wiry stature. As in other testing, test subject began by observing a dry and hot climate on entering the building. Test subject orders were to examine the rooms of SCP-358. One hour into testing, subject began complaining of dehydration and appeared slightly confused. After a duration of two hours within SCP-358, communication from the test subject stopped and D-Class personnel were sent in to retrieve test subject. The D-Class located the subject in a room near the entrance, unconscious, and was recovered. Test subject regained consciousness soon after administration of an IV drip. Upon waking, subject was observed to be in a persistent vegetative state, unable to function, and was subsequently admitted to Psychological Observation Facility A. Blood tests revealed trace amounts of a highly poisonous rattlesnake venom found in bite victims of the deserts of Southern California. As noted in Addenda 3581 and 3582, subject's shoes were filled with sand. Addendum 3584 On security patrols captured video footage of a humanoid apparition in the North Hall of SCP-358, begging for water. Comparison of video footage confirms that the apparition appears to exhibit mannerisms and appearance identical to test subject C, whose test results are noted in Addendum 3583. Subject C remains unresponsive in Psychological Observation Facility A and demonstrated no change in behavior during the event. Item Number SCP-352 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Containment area is to remain sealed at all times. No human interaction is allowed with SCP-352. Any and all interaction should be carried out via robot or other remote means. Should human interaction become necessary, full hazmat containment protocols should be observed. In addition, security lines must be attached to all personnel. Should any personnel begin to exhibit erratic behavior, they are to be immediately removed from the containment area via the security lines. Any staff reporting hallucinations after interaction with SCP-352 or her hair are to immediately be placed under quarantine. Any staff working in or around the containment area must submit to random psychological and physical testing. Anyone found to be contaminated will be placed into immediate quarantine. Staff attacked by SCP-352 may only be recovered if they have not been bitten by SCP-352. SCP-352 is to be fed only once weekly. Feeding will be discontinued for one month if SCP-352 attacks any personnel. Description SCP-352 appears to be a very old, emaciated woman of indeterminate age and race. SCP-352 speaks Old Russian but with an accent and dialect that makes translation very difficult. SCP-352 is extremely unwilling to communicate, with most of the conversations thus far made primarily of threats or statements of revenge. SCP-352 has never identified herself by any name, and due to her aggressive nature, it has been impossible to determine any background information. SCP-352 possesses a level of strength and speed much higher than what should be possible for a person of her perceived age and physical dimensions, and has been shown moving loads in excess of 200 kilograms with little physical strain, and moving at speeds in excess of 70 kilometers an hour. SCP-352 can recover from wounds that would be lethal to a human being, including decapitation and disemboweling. This regeneration can take between several days to several weeks depending on severity. Internally, SCP-352 appears to be a normal human woman, with muscles, bones, and organs in a state consistent with advanced age. Testing done on tissue samples has been inconclusive. 
SCP-352 is capable of growing very thin, hair-like strands from any part of her body. Apparently, it will. These strands can grow several meters in an hour, and appear to be at least partially under the control of SCP-352. They have been observed crawling along floors and up walls and other structures. These hairs are clear and nearly invisible to the naked eye, and appear to be slightly weaker than standard human hair. The strands are also coated in a thin layer of chemical enzyme, identical to the enzyme in the saliva of SCP-352. SCP-352 produces an enzyme that is most concentrated in the saliva and hair, but is present in all bodily tissues of SCP-352. How it is produced, and its exact chemical makeup, are unknown. This enzyme reacts on contact with human tissue, and rapidly attacks the nervous system. Symptoms manifest almost immediately, and include hallucinations, euphoria, suppression of cognitive or logical thinking, and suppression of pain receptors. This state persists for several days with mild exposure, and can become permanent with high exposure. Bites from SCP-352 lead to high exposure in 99.9% .9 of cases. SCP-352 appears to subsist on a carnivorous diet, with a strong preference for human flesh. SCP-352 will create a web of hair, and wait for prey to become exposed to the enzyme and become more docile. SCP-352 will often remove and eat the limbs of a prey item, to prevent it from wandering away, and can take several days to fully devour prey. Humans have been observed to still be in a euphoric state, and have no knowledge of the outside world, even as they suffer the loss of limbs and other bodily tissue. Addendum Notes on Recovery SCP-352 was recovered in southern Russia, near the town of <laughs> Reports of an enchanted forest, and a witch who had caused several deaths were initially ignored, until reports of the witch being found and captured began to surface. When Foundation agents responded, the town was found deserted. Several bodies were found in varying states of decomposition, and blood trails appeared to show many more bodies being dragged into the enchanted forest. Recovery teams were dispatched and captured SCP-352, but suffered heavy casualties due to SCP-352's attack and exposure to the enzyme. A large amount of hair was recovered as well, and is believed to be the cause of many exposure incidents with contact being attributed to spider webs or an agent's own hair and not reported until hallucinations manifested. Addendum Notes on Behavior While SCP-352 prefers any type of human flesh over any other type of meat, it appears to have a special propensity for children between 0 and 2 years of age. After observation of highly elevated levels of cooperation, and a reduced tendency to attack staff while consuming flesh of this type, a possible alteration in the current diet is being considered. Addendum The use of SCP-604 and SCP-1680 as a more efficient food source for SCP-352 is currently pending approval from the project director following initial testing. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, Subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.